What's up guys, welcome back to the channel and today I'm bringing to you the first part of my multi-part guide on suspension tuning. We're going even more in depth on this guide than with the gearing guide, so again, apologies in advance if you find the theory section of this guide boring. If it's not your cup of tea, feel free to skip ahead to the portion where I adjust settings in the game. But before we get started, if you find videos like these helpful, please like the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I put a lot of time and effort into this, so I want to make sure everyone is benefiting from this. Of course, I'm only human, so there might be a thing or two I've missed along the way here, so if you have any further contributions to this topic, please put those in the comments below. But without further ado, let's dive in. So in this first part of the guide, we're going to be talking about natural frequency, damping, and a bit of ride height. I'll cover ride height in more detail along with downforce in a future video, but it's necessary to include it here at least on a basic level, because it goes hand in hand with your other suspension settings. In general, you want to target as low of a ride height as possible for aerodynamics and a lower center of gravity, and that's all we really need to understand there for now. However, a low ride height can only function correctly when the suspension is set up properly. If your suspension isn't stiff enough, or you have too much pitch when the suspension is loading and unloading, you'll bottom out the car, which will cause really poor handling behavior and a loss of downforce, so we want to avoid that. But you can avoid that in two different ways. You can either raise the ride height, or we stiffen the suspension. Unfortunately, there's not much data available in Gran Turismo to look at suspension travel, so finding this ride height point might be another trial and error exercise. To start, I set both ends of the ride height around 25% on the slider to be safe, then I tune the rest of the car, and then I make small adjustments to the ride height as I go. It's also common to see a higher rear ride height than the front, and that is known as rake. There are benefits to be had with a certain amount of rake angle as far as weight transfer and aerodynamics are concerned, but I'll cover those more in the video with downforce, since it makes more sense to lump it in there for that discussion, and I don't want to make this video too long. Now, let's get into natural frequency. Natural frequency is just the rate at which the suspension will oscillate if left undamped. If your natural frequency is higher, the spring will move up and down faster, usually with less travel. If your frequency is lower, it will move up and down slower, usually with more travel. Most of you are probably used to spring rates, so I'm going to explain how spring rates relate to natural frequency, and why natural frequency is actually the preferred method for describing suspension settings. First, we'll describe what a spring rate is. We're going to use Hooke's law here, and we can see that spring force is equal to the displacement of a spring multiplied by its spring rate. The negative sign here is to show that the return force that the spring exerts is in the opposite direction to the force applied, so we can ignore that for this demonstration. By reorganizing this, the spring rate can be determined by applying a force to a spring and measuring how far that spring is compressed, and this is a bit easier to picture. Now you've probably seen spring rates, such as like pound per inch, or newtons per millimeter, or even something like kilogram force per millimeter, which is what they use in Gran Turismo 6, and that's exactly what this equation shows. Pounds and newtons are force units, and inches and millimeters are displacement units. We know that stiffer spring rates produce a stiffer ride, but there's also a weight component that needs to be considered. Every car's weight is different, so every car will need different spring rates to achieve ideal ride characteristics, and that makes things a bit tedious when you want to tune multiple cars and transfer learnings across those. There's also the matter of something called motion ratio, which is a result of the suspension geometry of the car. The motion ratio is the relationship between how much the tire moves versus how much the suspension moves. This can be approximated by taking the distance from the car body to the center of the wheel and the distance between the car body and the mounting point of the spring. This is the example diagram from the Beyond the Apex document in the game that describes motion ratio. The picture on the right shows a motion ratio of 1 to 1, or just 1, and the left picture shows a motion ratio of 0.5 to 1, or just 0.5. This is important because your suspension geometry will determine the wheel rate which can be thought of as the actual spring rate your wheel quote-unquote sees, so yet another variable you have to consider when setting up your suspension. There's also a small contribution here by the angle at which the suspension is mounted, but that's a finer detail that's not really too important for understanding everything here. Now, let's, let's take a step back. This is probably very confusing for a lot of people, and that's perfectly fine, because this stuff is complicated. It doesn't get any easier when you have to factor everything here that I've talked about so far when you're choosing the correct spring rates for every car. Fortunately, that's where natural frequencies come in. When deciding on a spring rate for your car, you can use this formula to determine the spring rate you need to achieve the desired natural frequency when given the other physical characteristics of the suspension. 
Notice that we also consider motion ratio here. So you can move the motion ratio squared term around and move it to the other side and think of this in terms of wheel rate. But we're trying to choose this ring rate here, so this arrangement makes the most sense. I'm not going into the derivation of this equation because it's outside the scope of this video. That information is out there if you're interested. But if we rearrange this to define natural frequency, we can see why this becomes useful. Notice that this contains every variable of the system that we've talked about so far. That is the spring rate, the mass, and the motion ratio. Natural frequency takes all of these things into account and simplifies the end result into something that translates to any car setup. You don't need to know specific corner weights, exact spring rates, or motion ratios in the game, since they're all accounted for in one neat little number. That's why natural frequency is the preferred measure used in suspension design, and will also help simplify the tuning process in GT7. There are some frequently recommended natural frequencies for multiple different automotive applications. While you don't have to follow this exactly, these are good starting points to keep in mind. And one thing I want you to notice is that the stiffness goes up as the performance application goes up, especially with downforce. And this is because more downforce will push down on the springs harder and affect your ride height at that particular speed. So stiff springs are required to counteract this and maintain the ideal ride height in as many situations as possible. Now that we've established what natural frequency is, we need to talk about damping. If you hit a bump while driving with no dampers, your suspension will oscillate at its natural frequency for quite some time. That is, it'll compress and expand however many times per second your natural frequency is. And that would obviously be bad if you're just bouncing down the road uncontrolled like this animation here. Dampers allow you to control the compression, or bump, and expansion, or rebound, of the spring so that you can control this oscillation or even eliminate it entirely. You can see this new animation here is a damped spring, disregarding the fact that the damper isn't pictured, but it eventually stops oscillating. Both settings are associated with the spring movement that they control. Compression damping controls the spring's compression, and expansion damping controls the spring's expansion. There are also damping settings for fast and slow compression and expansion, but those aren't included in GT7, so we're not going to cover those today. However, it's important to understand what soft or stiff damping settings do. The stiffer the damping setting, the longer it takes for an action to occur. So a stiff compression setting will make it so the spring takes longer to compress, and that will feel stiffer as a result. A stiff expansion setting will make it so the spring takes longer to expand, which can be good or bad for reasons I'll explain later. Construction and fine-tuning of dampers can be pretty complex, but their simplified role, as I've explained here, is all you really need to know as far as the game is concerned. We'll talk about how each change correlates to car handling characteristics in a little bit. Now that we have all the technical explanation out of the way, how can we apply all this knowledge in the game? As I stated before, there's not really any data to go off in the game, so the best we can do is apply some of this theory we've discussed, test the changes out on track, and then make adjustments from there. Knowing how each setting impacts handling makes this process much quicker, so I'll be going over that too. For a test bed, I'll be using the Mazda Tenza Group 4 car on Nürburgring GP, since I feel like I have a solid setup for this combination already, so the changes that impact the handling should be more apparent. For those that are interested in this setup, I've linked my video on it down in the description. However, I will be deviating a bit from the setup I use there, so that I have a larger range of adjustment on the springs to show some differences. A quick rule of thumb is that increasing front settings will increase the tendency to understeer, and decreasing them will increase the tendency to oversteer. Likewise, increasing rear settings will increase the tendency to oversteer, and decreasing them will increase the tendency to understeer. Things are a bit different for camber and toe in that regard, and rebound kind of works backwards to that rule, at least in real life, for reasons I'll explain shortly, but the rest of the settings follow that rule pretty closely. Also, I will be ignoring the rotational G numbers and performance points for tuning going forward. Some people get into the habit of changing things to max out the PP rating, thinking that the car is faster, but this usually isn't the case. Sometimes it works out, but a lot of times the rotational G value will be higher, despite the car obviously cornering worse when racing, so there's a flaw in the simulation somewhere. But I'll cover this more in part 2 of this tuning guide involving camber, toe, and roll bars, because the difference in real speed is much more apparent there. But first, we're going to look at natural frequency settings. Based on the recommended natural frequencies I showed earlier, let's start out at 3 Hz on both front and rear. As you tune, you'll probably have differences between front and rear, that's completely fine, but for now, we're going to keep in mind all the variables that go into natural frequency and set them equal as a starting point. 
Now that we have a baseline lap to refer to, we can start making changes. Generally, you'll want softer springs so the tires can follow the imperfections of the road better, but also keep in mind that we need the spring stiff enough so that we don't bottom out or have really sloppy weight transfer. The car might be easier to drive with softer springs and have more peak grip available at the tire, but if it responds too slowly for complex corners, then it'll be slower overall, so finding the right balance is important. Thankfully, many tracks are smooth, so we can get away with stiffer suspension most of the time, since there aren't many imperfections that will disrupt our ride. But keep in mind that curbs and runoffs might give you a bit more trouble if you choose to use them with a stiff setup. Here, we're going to set the natural frequencies back to where I had them on the original setup, which was closer to 4 Hz. I was getting some odd behavior during weight transfer with this car when setting it up. Uh, things like squatting on throttle or diving on the brakes and even a bit of body roll even when I had the roll bars pretty stiff. So I found stiffer natural frequencies to be a good remedy for that. Now, let's see how these changes compare to the baseline Ghost with a 3 Hz natural frequency. You can see as we're cornering through here, the increased steering response and more predictable behavior with weight transfer makes it a bit easier to navigate these corners at higher speeds. You'd think that bumpier tracks like NURB GP would work better with softer natural frequencies, but this is just an example of why it's so important to test and compare settings. While the difference in the Ghost is negligible, the steering response helps me keep a tighter line, which is really important in sectors like these on Nurburgring GP. There's also the added benefit of dropping performance points to fit into PP-based events. While I might want to go a little bit softer than what I have here, going with these frequencies to fit into the 630 PP event was the best choice at the time I made this setup. Also, remember what I said about bumps giving you more trouble with stiffer frequencies. You can see here that I have quite a bit of trouble getting through the chicane compared to a lower frequency unless I get it perfect. So make sure that's on your mind if you're tuning for a track that requires you to use curbs for the optimal line. Every car is different, some cars might like certain settings better than others, and some settings just work because of how the physics engine is implemented in the game. There's no real way to determine what's best without testing like this, so sometimes it's just as simple as making big changes and seeing how they affect the car. Now we're going to cover what happens when we have differences between the front and the rear natural frequencies. You can get away with pretty large differences in the game despite it not being best practice in real life, so it's worth a try. However, a lot of cars won't receive those differences very well, so again, it's a matter of testing this to find out. Typically, you'll have the front softer than the rear if you want a bit more response in the middle of a corner. That also comes with a larger weight transfer penalty, so if the car pitches too much, then setting the frequencies closer together again will probably alleviate that issue. Also, if the front is too stiff, you might have some trouble steering while exiting corners. Likewise, setting the rear softer than the front will give you less turn-in on entry so it can solve some major oversteer problems, but also keep in mind that there will be a lot of rear weight transfer under acceleration, and if it's too much, you might not have enough weight over the front tires to provide enough grip to exit the corner on the desired line. Rear stiffness can offer more steering, especially at higher speeds, but go too far and you'll lose too much rear grip to corner effectively. But overall, stiffer natural frequencies will make the car feel a bit more lively and squat or dive less, but keep in mind that there's a bit less grip available, and road imperfections will impact your ride more. With softer frequencies, you'll have a bit more grip available, but the car will feel a bit more dead and sloppy, and you also run the risk of bottoming out if you go too far. Now that we've covered natural frequencies on track, we're going to cover dampers. Damper adjustments come into play when trying to change the behavior of the car during transitions. Dampers will affect overall balance of the car when cornering, so they can be used to fine-tune car behavior when you feel your other settings are correct. First, we're going to talk about compression or bump. Bump damping is typically used to fine-tune the overall grip of the car based on the track surface. When bump is too soft, it allows the chassis to bounce after hitting a bump, and the car might wander around a bit and even roll. If it's too stiff, bumps can pull the tire away from the track surface, which can significantly reduce the grip that the tire has available until it settles. The latter phenomenon usually doesn't happen in most racing sims, so I tend to go pretty soft on bump settings. This seems to allow more initial response in cornering without affecting other behavior on the car. Stiffer bump settings can offer a bit more stability, but the car response might feel a bit more dead, and you'll feel bumps more. If you find that the overall stiffness of the car is alright, but you'd like the car to be a bit more lively, that's a good sign that you should make a bump adjustment over something like natural frequency.
To demonstrate that, let's increase the bump settings to around halfway and compare them to soft settings. You can see here that the car overall feels fine, but it's a bit more numb on initial response, so it's overall a bit slower. I'm not having any issues with wandering or roll during transitions, so it's safe to say I can get away with softer bump damping here. I would say you're pretty safe by staying soft with bump most of the time, but if you're having some instability or wandering issues that you just can't quite fix, you can try stiffening this setting a bit. Now we'll talk about expansion or rebound. Remember that this involves controlling the rate at which the spring expands, so these settings might sound a bit backwards at first until you get used to them. Rebound is used to fine tune the handling balance of the car, so you may find yourself changing this more often than compression or bump. A soft rebound setting will allow the spring to expand quickly, but you'll lose some stability here because the tire wants to move further and closer or back and forth to the track surface because of the spring's oscillation. On the other hand, a stiff rebound setting will allow the spring to expand slower and more controlled, which offers stability, but if it's too stiff, the spring can't expand to a neutral state before hitting the next point where it would compress again. This causes something called jacking down, where the suspension continuously gets more and more compressed without expanding, and it becomes functionally stiffer and stiffer. This makes it so the suspension can't travel properly to do its job in controlling the car, and in some cases you might even have the inside wheel pull away from the track surface, which obviously results in less grip. Just like with bump, the latter situation usually doesn't happen in racing sims, so going towards the stiff side on expansion damping is very common. Let's compare a soft rebound setting to our baseline stiff settings and see how they compare. You can see here that the car is a bit less controlled on exit with softer rebound damping, and while it's not as apparent on a four-wheel drive car, this will really show up on other drivetrain configurations, particularly rear-wheel drive. The amount of grip available isn't consistent until the car stabilizes, so our cornering performance isn't consistent either. Available grip at the tire is varying more here than with a stiff rebound setting, and it's lower when you average it out, so we're slower overall through the corner because we have less average grip. One more thing to cover with dampers is adjusting front versus rear. It's important to understand what settings cause understeer and oversteer on each phase of a corner so you can make the appropriate adjustments. When you're accelerating forward, you have weight transfer to the rear of the car. That means the front suspension is in rebound and the rear suspension is in compression. With this in mind, we can make damping changes to alter the characteristics of the car. If we have oversteer towards the exit, we can soften front rebound or soften rear bump or both. If we have understeer in this scenario, we can stiffen either or both of those settings. Similarly, applying the brakes will result in weight transfer to the front. That means the front suspension is in compression and the rear is in rebound. With the same logic as rear weight transfer, we can make the appropriate changes. If we have oversteer with forward weight transfer mainly on corner entry, we can stiffen front bump or stiffen rear rebound or both. If there's understeer in this scenario, we can soften either or both of those settings. Usually you'll make the change to the opposite end of the car that has the grip issue, but again, you can experiment with these settings to figure out what works best for you. At this point, I think you get the idea on how these settings impact handling, so I'll leave it up to you to test this yourself, as I think that will be much more valuable than just showing another demonstration in the video. Also, I'll leave this cheat sheet on the screen so you can refer back to it quickly if needed. One other unique scenario to look out for with damping is heavy braking. With too stiff of a rear rebound, it can actually take too long for the rear to expand, which causes the rear tires to take longer to make full contact with the track. This can cause oversteer under braking, so try actually softening rear rebound if you're having this issue and brake bias isn't fixing it. This is kind of a niche scenario, but I just wanted to cover it just in case you run into it. Well, I hope you're all still awake after that one, because uh, I've covered a lot of information here, and I hope the theoretical explanations helped, but if the only takeaways for you are the effects on oversteer and understeer, then I'm glad I still helped you learn something. If you have any questions on this material, or you want to provide supplemental information on anything I've gone through today, please leave that in the comments below. As always, if you found this video informative, please leave a like, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I will catch you all in part two. Thanks.